So good morning. Uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here for this uh, 50th anniversary uh, session. Uh, and uh, what I want to do in uh, the 45 minutes uh, we have together uh, this morning uh, is to talk about uh, one of the key shifts that I see in organizations today. Uh, as David has said, not just academically, but in terms of my consulting work, uh, for me, there is a, a fundamental shift uh, that I increasingly see sort of uh, crystallizing in really what uh, uh, differentiates the great organizations, the ones that are really emerging today that are really uh, dominating, and that I would argue continue to dominate for the next generation or so. Uh, I think they're different than organizations were uh, that were successful a few years ago. Uh, because 20 years ago, the companies that failed typically had the wrong strategy. They were just doing the wrong thing. So they were building, they were, had huge steel mills uh, when we wanted micro mills. Uh, they had a huge uh, Xerox machines when we wanted uh, small uh, desktop uh, uh, photocopiers. Or they had uh, small uh, grocery stores when we wanted big out of town uh, hypermarkets. So you're just doing the wrong thing. But this is not typically the case today. Uh, the companies that fail are very different to the companies that failed uh, a generation ago. And what I see as the key shift uh, is something that operates both at an individual level in terms of your career, uh, but also at an organizational level. Because if we just focus on the career for a minute, what used to happen in your career is you started off in whatever profession uh, you thought was the right area. You may have been right. Uh, you may not have been. Uh, and uh, you started at the bottom of the ladder and you worked hard and slowly climbed your way up that ladder uh, till you got knowledge and expertise. And then you became valuable because you knew stuff. Uh, so you're a lawyer and you uh, become an expert in employment law or tax law. Uh, you're a salesperson, you get expertise in uh, how to kind of uh, you know, sell and close the sale. Uh, you're an expert engineer, you know about this particular thing or this particular IT program. Uh, and that makes you valuable. And so what you saw is that individuals and organizations became successful because they knew stuff. They had what we call human capital. The problem is, uh, what I want to argue this morning, is simply knowing stuff is no longer enough. For me, the fundamental shift that I see in organizations is away from simply having human capital towards uh, what I call social capital. Now, what is this distinction? Well, um, uh, simply having this human capital, this knowledge and expertise, well, it's actually quite hard to have something that is unique and sustainable. Uh, because you can innovate in products or services, uh, but other people, particularly in a technology-enabled world, uh, can mimic it uh, very quickly. Social capital is what I want to argue is really what's defining the great organizations that are emerging today. And this is the ability to get things done through other people. Now, let me give you an example of this. I was speaking to the CEO of one of the big computer games manufacturers recently. Uh, and these are big businesses. This is not just a few students in their bedroom. These are big, uh, big businesses. And this guy said something that stayed with me. He said, Richard, uh, as CEO, I don't know what games kids want today. And I definitely don't know the technology that we'll have to develop in order to build those games. So my job as CEO, in fact, the job of the entire board is to create an environment where people entering the organization from below can really drive the change. For me, this is uh, something that I see increasingly sort of uh, clear uh, out there in the business world. The great organizations, one where we know where we're going, uh, why we're here, what we want to achieve. And we create an environment where everybody feels uh, that they can actually influence and impact that, that they can play their role. That's kind of it uh, for me in terms of uh, a key point. Now, that sounds very easy, uh, but uh, it's not. Uh, because uh, actually, creating these organizations that are not just top down, well, it gets much more complex. Because there's a phrase uh, I used to hear a lot about cascading information down the hierarchy. And this, for me, is everything about a human capital world. Because the assumption in the uh, concept of cascading information is that there is one super brain at the top of the organization with some vessel of knowledge or wisdom. And they pour it down the mountainside. 
and it tumbles, nourishing the people. There may even be a few drops for the little people at the bottom of the mountain. That's the human capital world. That isn't how great organizations operate today. But the great thing about that is if you're you know, senior, and by the way, many senior people today say, the reason I've worked so damn hard my entire career is so I can be at the top of the mountain and sort of, sort of pour this uh, wisdom out of this uh, vessel that I've accumulated over all these years. That's why I've been working so hard. It just increasingly isn't working, particularly, and we won't focus on this because we have Tammy in the room who is much more of authority on this than me, uh, particularly this millennial generation. Uh, and again, these millennials, they want to be involved. They want to have a voice. They want to say, hey, uh, where are we going? How can I help? Uh, you know, and uh, you know, what's my development plan? How am I really going to be growing and developing in this? Saying, you know, sit there, shut up, and wait five years, and maybe we'll promote you. Uh, I think, Tammy, we can safely say it doesn't really kind of work uh, uh, anymore. <laughs> so the problem is that we have to operate with much greater complexity. Uh, some of you may have come across VUCA. Is anyone, is anyone familiar with VUCA? This is something I came across about five, six years ago doing a project with an American firm. And uh, we came across it working with West Point, the American Military Academy. And they said, we're training soldiers uh, today, well, training sorry, soldiers for tomorrow to operate in VUCA conditions. So this is a cluster of interrelated concepts. Let me quickly go through it. The V stands for volatility, just because the speed of change. Things are going so much faster. And that's exactly why this human capital doesn't work. You may say, I have this expertise. Well, uh, in a uh, world of uh, uh, sort of uh, big data and uh, the internet of things, this really uh, doesn't last very long. Um, the o, uh, U is uncertainty, because we just can't predict what's going to happen. It's not just these major extreme uh, events, what uh, Nicholas Taleb called black swan events. It's just we don't really know what's going to happen in the next year or two. I remember uh, <coughs> a few decades ago now, uh, or almost 30 years ago, I was um, uh, working in industry uh, and uh, as a brand manager. And we had these plans for each of our, our sort of brands, uh, and it was a 10-year plan. Uh, so you had uh, what are sales going to be over the next 10 years? And the graph used to go a bit like this, you know, uh, uh, those uh, old graphs uh, you may have uh, had in your uh, uh, earlier careers. Uh, and um, we had 10-year sales, 10-year costs, 10-year cash flows, and that's how we ran the business. It kind of, it kind of feels a bit of a joke uh, thinking about that uh, today. Uh, the C is just for complexity. There's so many different forces, both internal forces uh, and obviously external forces. Uh, the regulators, all these different uh, sort of interest groups, uh, uh, political uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of influence, uh, let alone any sort of social media groups uh, who happen to have a point of view about you or your business. And finally, it's ambiguity. And in the military, they call this the fog of war because we don't really know what's going on. Because um, if we go to, uh, away from business for a minute and just uh, go to the world of biology, there's a principle in biology that if you're in a simple environment like the ocean, you can be a simple organism like a jellyfish. Okay? You don't need to adapt. You don't need to be involved. You can be simple. It kind of works. And you can just float around for millennia. Uh, the problem is uh, that as organizations are getting so much more complex, because we need these greater interdependencies, it's not just about one, uh, what they used to call the, uh, the great man theory of leadership in the 1930s. You just needed a Henry Ford or whatever it may be, and that was the answer. It didn't work very well in the 1930s. Uh, a few examples of uh, people who were thought to be great men who didn't turn out to be quite so great. Uh, and uh, it definitely doesn't work uh, today. And as the writer Mencken said, there's always an easy solution to every human problem. Neat, plausible, and wrong. So, uh, the challenge here, as uh, Russ Akov put it, is that the only problems that have simple solutions uh, are simple problems. So we're living in this world where just all these interdependencies, we've got to deal with people. Organizations would be wonderfully simple places if we didn't have all these people in them. Uh, and even despite all these artificial intelligence, uh, I don't think we're going to have organizations without people anytime uh, soon. Uh, and in the organizational behavior department, uh, with myself and Tammy and others, uh, I don't think we're going to run out of work uh, for a few generations yet. Um, so uh, the problem here is that we're not very good at handling complexity. We kind of find it a bit overwhelming, and it's getting harder to really stay focused uh, with this complexity. 
because I want to argue there is a disease that's spreading through uh, our organizations. Just at the time that we need to really be shifting our focus from knowledge and expertise towards this ability to get things done through other people. A disease is making this harder and harder. Let me share with you some of the symptoms of this disease. Uh, the disease is what I call hurry sickness. And here are just some of the typical symptoms, both from your professional life and from your personal life. Number one, uh, if you're microwaving something just for 30 seconds, uh, you have to do something else whilst you're waiting for the microwave uh, to go ping. You get a buzz from just catching a plane or a train. So you're rushing to catch the train, you leap on just before the doors close. Yes. And as for the airport, you are a master of airport management. Uh, the fastest route there, which queue should I go in? Uh, some of you may have seen that George Clooney movie, Up in the Air. A masterclass of airport management. Uh, you do something else whilst you drive. Uh, listen to the radio, be on the phone, eat your breakfast, put on your makeup, but you're kind of multitasking whilst you drive. Uh, you eat at your desk uh, whilst checking your email, sometimes on the phone at the same time. Uh, you do something else whilst brushing your teeth, particularly if you have an electric uh, toothbrush. Uh, you get impatient while waiting in line or waiting in traffic. Uh, you check your mobile phone multiple times an hour. Now, this may shock you, uh, but uh, within executive education, we occasionally get participants uh, checking their phones during lectures. I know it sounds astonishing, but it does uh, occasionally happen. Uh, you hate the time it takes to boot up your computer. In fact, you probably hate this so much, you never really turn that computer off in you know, sleep or hibernate mode. Uh, you find yourself wanting to interrupt other people frequently. Now, you may be polite enough, you don't, but you're sitting there thinking, come on, I've already got the point, you're going on and on. Um, you do something else in telephone conferences. So if there are 20 people on a conference call, typically you have one person speaking and 19 people uh, doing their email, preferably on mute, but there is an ultimate symptom to know if you have this disease, which is that when you get into an elevator, you have a favorite button, and on that button there are two words that say, closed doors. Now, you know how technology works. Uh, you don't just push that button once. <laughs> You've got to keep pushing the damn thing, because that's going to make a difference. So how many of you in the room here recognize some of these symptoms within yourself? Okay, you are a very sick group of executives. Uh, and uh, the pro in fact, some of you may be so sick, you're genuinely sitting there thinking, well, what's the problem, Richard? <laughs> I'm busy. I've got to get a lot of stuff done. That's kind of my job. Well, if you're that sick, I'll, I'll help you here. Uh, in fact, the first uh, piece of help comes directly uh, from this door close button because um, I worked a few years ago with one of the elevator manufacturers. Uh, and I remember one of the directors saying to me, Richard, uh, it's really frustrating for us. There's this new and rather expensive trend uh, that's making our life tough. He said, people are pressing these damn buttons so much, they're just wearing out. Uh, and we keep having to replace them. But he continued, he said, but the irony here, Richard, is that what most people don't seem to realize is that over half of the door close buttons in the world are not connected to anything. It's just a light bulb. Push away. In fact, in the trade, they call them mechanical placebos. Uh, in fact, in the US, it is illegal for the door close button to be anything other than a light bulb. Uh, so uh, there's a problem with this button, but there's a much more fundamental problem, which is as an executive, wherever you are, the challenge in this increasingly complex world is to stop in our incredibly busy lives and think. Now, here we have Thomas Watson Sr., who founded IBM in 1914 and ran it until his retirement in 1956. And he famously had the word think put above his desk. And if you ever meet anyone who's ever worked at IBM, they will tell you this is in the DNA of the culture. At IBM, they're just uh, sort of so uh, sort, of, uh, sort of trained, don't just do stuff, stop and think. In fact, so important was this to uh, Thomas Watson Sr., uh, that uh, they actually trademarked the word think in relation to business 14 years before they even trademarked the brand name IBM. So uh, in his day, it was tough enough, but our technology-enabled lives is increasingly tough because around 80% of executives, the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning 
is they check their phone. The last thing they do when they're lying in bed at night is check their phone. In fact, we're connected often every second in between. Uh, in fact, we used to have something called holiday, vacation, remember that? Uh, well, again, the vast majority of executives now check their phone uh, when they're on uh, vacation. So this ability to protect time to think has become increasingly tough in these very busy lives that we all lead. And there's a wonderful phrase they have in Florida that for me gets at the heart of the issue. They say, when you're fighting off the alligators, it's hard to remember you were trying to drain the swamp. Now, if your strategic objective is to drain the swamp, and here we have a Florida swamp, the Everglades, if you want to drain the waterway so you can build stuff, well, the problem is there are alligators there. And if an alligator attacks you, you kind of need to defend yourself. Uh, but here's the problem. We've become a generation of alligator fighters. Our parents' generation, uh, they look at us as if we were idiots. Put your phone away, it's dinner time. It's the weekend. Why are you doing all this stuff? Have a life. Uh, they just don't really get it. They think we're screwing up. They may be right, because we've had to kind of adapt to technology coming into our lives. Again, I speak for most of us, if not all of us, I hope. Uh, again, many of us can remember a time before email. Uh, but now the average executive spends between three and six hours a day doing their email. Doing email, it's just, it makes me feel tired just thinking about the phrase, doing email. Uh, we never used to have this stuff. Now, again, I'm not anti-email, email can be awesome. But in studies I've done over the last 10 years, over 95% of executives say emails kind of got out of control. It's become a nightmare. So uh, the problem, however, is not technology. The problem is us. We're addicted to alligator fighting. Uh, remember the old uh, Blackberry with the red flashing light? Yep. Now, a red flashing light in almost every society in the world means what? Danger. Urgent action required right now. So uh, it's almost impossible to a red flashing light uh, sort of in front of you not to do something. And even with the iPhone or whatever you have today, you've got that sort of red button here. When you check your email, you trigger a process in your core limbic brain called the mesolimbic pathway. This is the classic reward process that you get with any addiction. It's exactly the same, whatever the addiction is, you trigger the production of a hormone called dopamine. Uh, it used to be called the crackberry for very good reason. Uh, so the fact we're checking our email every seven or eight minutes on average, uh, this is not a rational thing, it's just an addiction. We're kind of screwing up. And by the way, this millennial generation, they look at us as if we're real losers. Kind of, what are you guys doing? Now, I'm not saying they don't check their phones, but they're damn sight more efficient and how they communicate with each other than we are. In fact, uh, I had a participant in a program uh, just uh, last week who said, uh, Richard, uh, yeah, well, actually, um, uh, my, uh, my daughter, my millennial daughter, did send me an email because she needed to send me attachment, but then texted me to tell me uh, that she'd sent me an email. Uh, because, you know, email is just for, you know, like, heavy lifting. You don't, wouldn't talk on an email. Uh, so things are changing. Uh, and... Uh, it kind of feels good to fight an alligator. It's what we call being achievement-oriented. Uh, but this is the core of the problem. Because what we need to do here is really stand back in this incredibly interdependent uh, world that we live in to stop and think about what's really important. So uh, when I'm coaching senior executives, there's often an exercise I do uh, when I get them to write down on a piece of paper what their top three priorities are. Now, I've asked all of you in this room to write down your top three priorities. Uh, you could do that pretty quickly. Uh, and then I say, okay, let's look at your diary for the last three months. What percentage of your time have you spent on your top three priorities? For most of us, that's kind of a scary analysis. I remember doing it with one CEO who said to me, uh, uh, ooh, Richard, that's not going to be good. Uh, uh, but after our session, he actually got somebody in his team to analyze his diary for the last three months. And our next coaching session, he showed it to me and he said, Richard, this is embarrassing. He said, I spend 1% of my time on my top priority. He said, I know this sounds crazy, but what it feels like is I just don't have time. 
to focus on my priorities. Uh, in the words of uh, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, most people would sooner die than think, and most do. So what this hurry sickness leads to is a real challenge here, which I want to focus on in the second half of this session, which is in this complex, interconnected world, how do we build what I would call a confident organization? And there's a spectrum here around confidence. Uh, and I want to argue the two extremes of this are dangerous places to go. Because if we're not careful, we just bounce from one extreme to the other. My hypothesis this morning is the great organizations spend more time in the middle of this spectrum. And the less good ones just bounce from one extreme to the other. Let's talk about uh, overconfidence to start with. What does this look like? Well, just arrogance. Yeah, we're the best. We're number one. You guys are losers. Uh, hubris, and hubris is often defined as the pride that goes before the fall. Uh, grandiosity, which is an unrealistic sense of self. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Is it the same as everyone else sees? Now, grandiosity can feel pretty good, uh, but again, it has enormous dangers. Uh, and just in plain old-fashioned intimidation. Uh, so here's a little video, uh, if I can get this to work, that just illustrates how this works. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course over. Thank you, Captain. I'm not urbanizing. Change your course. Over. Sir, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, but I will report to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse mate. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Captain. In the words of Mark Twain, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. You may be feeling pretty pleased with how great you are as an organization, how successful you are as an executive. The problem is there are rocks out there. You know, a track record of success and performance uh, is no guarantee of future performance because organizational life cycles are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, so, feeling pretty, pretty pleased. Well, it doesn't, uh, you may have caught something you think is pretty special. It doesn't always end very well. So, that's overconfidence. What about the other end of the spectrum, underconfidence? What does this look like? Well, there's a phrase here we talk about learned helplessness. <sighs> what can you do? Uh, I think, uh, David, you showed a video on the, oh, we we'll are showing a video later uh, that relates to this, which is a fantastic one. Uh, they just feel like a victim of the circumstances. Oh, I've been telling them for years we're doing it wrong, but nobody listens to me. Oh, all that kind of sort of uh, bleating. Uh, and then there's something called the bystander effect. Now, the bystander effect is kind of terrifying. In villages of around 150 people, which is how we've lived throughout uh, sort of history, uh, you look after each other. Once you get beyond about 150 people, something called Dunbar's number is 148. Uh, is what uh, uh, an anthropologist would suggest, then we just stop looking after each other. Uh, and we've just become bystanders. So they've, they've done studies where they get an actor to lie on the street uh, in a village, pretending to be unwell. You know, kind of, Ooh. The first person who comes up says, are you OK? Can I help? You do this in a large city, well, uh, it kind of can get uh, a, bit, uh, a bit scary. Here's uh, just a video of uh, a news report illustrating how this works. A good Samaritan who helped save a woman from a mugger is stabbed and then collapses to the ground. And for one hour, no one stops to help him as he lay there dying. It was all caught on tape. Lindsay Davis has the story. This grainy video is actually rather clear. <coughs> what happened and what didn't on this street in Queens, New York last Sunday, just after 5.30 in the morning. A woman is followed by a man who then accosts her. 31-year-old Hugo Alfredo Talayax walks toward them. What we can't see is him being stabbed several times in the torso while trying to save the woman. 
Within seconds, the camera captures video of the attacker running away. Tala Yak starts to chase him, but then collapses. But watch what happens next. One minute later, a potential good Samaritan walks right by, and so does the next person, and the one after that. A procession of more than 20 people notice Tala Yak's on the ground, yet fail to help. One man pulls out his cell phone and snaps a picture. Another guy nudges him and rolls him over twice, sees blood, but then walks away. They estimated the girl as callous. I don't understand how you can walk past somebody, see them in, and, and need to help and just continue to walk by. At 7.23 a.m., firefighters arrive. He laid here for about an hour and a half until someone finally called 911 for help. But what these security cameras captured has been seen. So I think we kind of get the point here. This goes on and on. There are example of example of this all around the world. We just kind of become passive. Uh, and uh, a colleague of mine at uh, Stanford, Jeff Pfeffer, said it's easy and often comfortable to feel powerless. To say, I don't know what to do. I don't have the power to get it done. And besides, I can't really stomach the struggle that may be involved. It's easy and now quite common to say when confronted with some mistake in your organization. It's not really my responsibility. Such a response excuses us from trying to do things. In not trying to overcome opposition, we will make ourselves fewer enemies and are less likely to embarrass ourselves. It is, however, a prescription for both organizational and personal failure. Uh, kind of this sort of Franz Kafka novel of this awful sort of bureaucracy and impersonal thing where you're not you, you're a human resource. Sometimes literally a number these impersonal organizations we've created. Uh, it's sort of uh, something where strange things happen. Smart people do really stupid things. And then when those smart people come together, they do really, really stupid things. Never underestimate the ability of smart people to come together and do something very, very stupid. Uh, so really where this leaves us uh, is a story uh, about uh, a colleague uh, of, uh, of ours here at the school, who I would argue was uh, the greatest professor we've ever had at London Business School, uh, the great uh, Sumantra Ghoshal. Uh, and he was here for 11 years, uh, and tragically he died well before his time in 2005. Uh, and I had the privilege of working with him uh, for uh, five years. Uh, he was uh, a close uh, and a friend and a colleague of Costas's. And Sumantra, he could just see things more clearly than the rest of us. We were all you know, struggling in the fog uh, to try and see some trends and stuff. Sumantra could just see things more clearly. And he was famous because with pretty much every group he ever taught, uh, he shared the same story. It's a story that's resonating uh, with executives all around the world. Uh, and in the story, he compares and contrasts two very different environments. Downtown Calcutta in the middle of summer versus the forest of Fontainebleau in spring. I think there's a business school in Fontainebleau. I may have got that wrong. but. He used to work there. Uh, and here is Sue Mantra sharing the story uh, at uh, the World Economic uh, Forum. Individuals do not change fundamentally <coughs> who they are without a very serious personal crisis of some kind. But the conclusion again, or for us perhaps, the, the key conclusion is that is a wrong question to ask. Revitalizing people has a lot less to do with changing people and has a lot more to do with changing the context that companies, that senior managers, that people in this room create around their people. Now, a context, uh, some manager called it the smell of the place, it, it's a hard thing to describe. And then let me try to describe it the best way I experience it, through my sort of personal experience, if you wish. I, I teach at the London Business School. I live in London, have done so for the last year and a half. Before that, I lived in Fontainebleau in France for about eight years. But one look at me, and then one sound of my accent, then you know I do not come from either of these two wonderful places in the world. I come from India, from the eastern part of India. My hometown is the city of Calcutta. So every year I go to Calcutta. In the month of July, that's the only time when my children have a summer vacation. But Calcutta is a wonderful town in, in winter, autumn, uh, in spring, but, but summer. 
Well, the temperature is 102, 103. Uh, the humidity is about 99%. And I feel very tired. Most of my vacation, I'm tired. I'm indoors. I used to live in Fontainebleau. And this I genuinely challenge you. Go to the forest of Fontainebleau in spring. Go with a firm desire to have a leisurely walk. And you can't. The moment you enter the forest, there is something about the crispness of the air. There is something about the smell of the trees in, in, in spring. You'd want to jump, you'd want to jog, you'd want to catch a branch, run, do something. And that, I believe, is the essence of the problem. Most companies, particularly large companies, have created downtown Calcutta in summer inside themselves. And then they complain, they say, you know, you're lazy and you don't take initiative and you don't do take cooperation, you are not changing the company. This is it's not about changing me. I have a lot of energy in, in, in spring in Fontainebleau, and I'm a bit tired uh, in summer in, in, in Calcutta. And, and that's the issue. To change, ultimately, beyond all these abstractions of strategy, of organization, of processes, at the end, the issue is, how do we change the context? How do we create Fontainebleau forests inside companies? This is fantastic. I think this gets, really, for me, at the heart of the issue. But what does it feel like in your organization? Here we have the forest of Fontainebleau in spring. Just that energized place. It's kind of fun. I kind of look forward to going to work. Even if the economy's gone to hell, even if uh, they're sort of struggling, actually often there's the times when we learn the most. It can be the most rewarding work we do and it's really difficult. As uh, Nietzsche says, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So, um, we have this spectrum here. And the question that I work with, with uh, executives uh, a lot of the time on, uh, uh, on uh, executive education programs is this question. What are the characteristics of confident organizations in your experience? Uh, and uh, there are very clear themes emerging. We do these very fun exercises, uh, simulations, uh, games, where we get people to try and create a, a, a sort of a, an organization and just see how tough it is to get coordinated action, even with a tiny bit of complexity, let alone some of the massive organizations uh, we work with here at the school. So what are the themes that are emerging? Let me take you through a, key, a few of them. First of them, perhaps the most fundamental one, uh, is uh, this sense uh, of uh, purpose. Uh, and uh, where are we going? Why does this organization, what's the shared course that we are passionate about? Wouldn't it be cool if we could get there? That would be fun. That's worth uh, me uh, really uh, putting uh, my, uh, the incredible effort into this that's going to be required. Secondly, the leaders, senior managers, have to role model the needed behaviors. I was in a supermarket a few years ago, and there's a mother there with two young children. I don't know if you've ever had to take two young children out of a supermarket, but if you have, you'll know this is a stressful experience. And these children were getting bored, and the little boy uh, hit his sister, and she started screaming. And the mother went over to her young son, and she said, don't hit your sister. Genius. The words were crystal clear, but zero impact on his behavior, because he knows in that family, if you want things done, you hit people because that's the behavior that's been role modeled from the top. In the words of the psychologist uh, Baldwin, children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. As a parent myself, this is terrifying, <laughs> because it's true. So uh, you are a role model, whether you think you are or not. The third one here is the situation I touched on before, where everyone feels that they can impact the system. And I think the challenge that millennials are, they're not different, than that, but they're just accelerating this challenge. We want to kind of feel that we can do things that play to our strengths, things we're good at, uh, that are actually going to help the organization achieve its ambition. Um, that's what it really looks like. And again, uh, there's loads of examples uh, from my experience, consulting experience, of organizations that actually have created this. Everyone understands where we're going. Uh, and really feels that they can uh, impact it. Uh, and uh, one major study showed that 95% of employees are either unaware of or do not understand the company's strategy. They don't understand it, 95%. And yet, if you ask any senior management team, A, do you have a vision and strategy? Oh, yes. 
And B, have you communicated it? Oh, definitely. I sent them an email. I, I did a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we had a town hall meeting, whatever those are. Uh, they don't seem to work very well. Uh, all this sort of stuff, uh, it doesn't actually work. Uh, but we need to know where we're going, and we need to feel we can contribute. Then collaboration. Now, collaboration, this social capital point, there are two key elements in here. Challenge. High-performing teams have high levels of challenge and conflict. Yeah? That's not good enough. You shouldn't be doing that. That's not consistent with our values. Uh, are we really sort of challenging each other? Are the relationships robust enough to do that? John Gottman, uh, one of the key researchers on marriage, found that probably one of the single biggest predictors of successful marriages uh, is that any successful relationship has conflict. So some of you may be thinking, that's a relief for uh, looking at your personal life. Uh, but they're able to resolve those conflicts respectfully. Yeah, so we need that challenge. But we also need that support. Because in a village of 140, 150 people, we look after each other. Are we really going to look after each other? Care about each other? Uh, it's not easy to create. Trust. Uh, trust, well, one way or the other, your attitude to people creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think people can't be trusted, you will be right. You take those same people, give them a boss who does trust people, who absolutely believes these people are going to do a great job, and they will improve their performance. The old saying, if you treat people as adults, they behave as adults. Treat them like children, they behave like children. And then two-way communication. Now, this cascading from the top of the mountain, it's not, it's not what defines great organizations, increasingly. Uh, but it's still what defines most communication here. Communication needs to be two ways. If there was one gift I would give executives that in my experience be more valuable than any other gift I would give, it would be the gift of listening. We get worse at it as we get more senior, and yet increasingly defines our success. Because it's not just about gathering information from you know, people wherever they are in the hierarchy. It's this ability to make people feel valued. It's such a critical skill. Uh, and this is how you really build uh, loyalty to the organization. Now, I've been on the faculty here at London Business School for the last, uh, gosh, uh, 17 years. Uh, and in that time, I've, for 17 years, I've taught courses here around organizational change. How do you lead change? And a few years ago, I kind of realized that all these guest speakers, these great leaders of change have, that I've had come and share their experience uh, over the years, uh, they all kind of pretty much say the same thing, which is this. Uh, you've got about three months to figure out what needs to change. If you're in a new role or stepping into a new organization, you've got a sort of honeymoon period here. You've got to figure it out. Once you've figured out what needs to change, do it. Because people always tell you to be careful. Yeah? Don't upset anyone. Don't break anything. It's a bit how it feels is, well, how it always feels is as if you're in a china shop. Now, for a clumsy person like myself, this is terrifying. Uh, uh, I probably would just turn out, walk out of the shop uh, and go somewhere else. Uh, but this is what it feels like. People always tell you, be careful. Don't upset anyone. Don't break anything. Don't affect the cash flow or the profit. Or don't upset the customers or the clients. Just don't break anything. <clears throat> but here's the problem. In the second half of your career in particular, it's much more dangerous to feel that you're in a china shop than to push through the things you believe are right. Because organizations are not china shops. They're more like gardens. Uh, it's very hard to kill a garden. Yeah, if you do what you think is right, you may make some mistakes. And that's absolutely fine. The challenge in these uh, organizations that are emerging is to take personal risk. To figure out what you think needs to change, you need to stand back from the alligators in order to do that. To really focus on what it means to drain the swamp. And then have the personal courage to really push through the things that you believe are right, the things that you're passionately committed to. Because the organizations we're part of, they could be better. Are we going to be bystanders? Or are we going to actually take that personal risk required to really step it up? And I want to close with a quotation from Mark Twain, who said, 20 years from now, 
you'll be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, the ropes. Sail away from the safe harbor. So I hope there's some food for thought here, some challenge about what you can do to play your role and to encourage others to play their roles, to make sure that you're part of these great and confident organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you.